No one understands the ins and outs of the president's plan better than FRC's Connor Simmelsberger, especially when it comes to the major landmines for American families. Tonight, our director of federal affairs takes us behind the curtain of the extremism tucked in the Democrats' 2,500-page bill. Connor, it's good to have you back on the program. Great to be here, Tony. All right, let's take a look at some of these top areas of concern. Let's start first with the issue of life. Where does this stand on the issue of the sanctity of human life? This is about as bad as it gets. And what I mean by that is this would directly fund abortions in our country, something our U.S. Congress for over 40 years has decided they should not do to save the conscience of American people to not fund abortions in our country. And so this would expand programs like Medicaid-like programs uh, in the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, to fund abortions, bypassing the bipartisan Hyde Amendment. So the Hyde Amendment that has been in place since uh, 1975, 76, that is, is being completely circumvented with this new uh, Medicaid-like program. Also, the extension of the Obamacare uh, provisions that were expanded back during the COVID, uh, the height of the COVID uh, outbreak, the pandemic. So this would be carried forward without any restrictions whatsoever on funding for abortion. That's right. You know, when you look at this 2,500 page bill, you might be looking for the words abortion, but that's the exact opposite. When a bill like this is silent on the word abortion in these health care programs, unless protections are in place, uh, like the Hyde Amendment, it will, in fact, uh, fund abortions. And so that's why it's really buried in the details that these massive new health care programs uh, will be circumventing uh, other federal laws to get uh, money out there to the Planned Parenthoods of the world and fund abortions in our nation. You know, just by fr for a frame of reference, the Obamacare legislation, the Affordable Care Act, which was passed back in uh, 2009, uh, Nancy Pelosi, you remember, she said, uh, we have to pass it so we can see what's in it. That bill was a little over 900 pages. This is more than double. And yet for the last decade, we have been discovering what was actually in that bill and how it's been interpreted. So I can only begin to imagine what we are going to find as we go even deeper into this reconciliation bill as things have been tucked away in that. So not only does it deal with the issue of abortion, but how does it deal with the issue of marriage? Yeah, you know, when talking about family life, marriage, rearing children, raising those children, this bill attacks all those facets that make a good, healthy marriage form and flourish. You talk about marriages, one way this bill would do this uh, is through penalizing married couples. If you're a single mother working hard to make an income on the earned income tax credit, if you choose to get married, you would be taxed double what you'd already be taxed under the existing marriage penalty. So rather than uh, promoting marriage, a good thing for our nation, uh, this disincentivized marriage, something that is so key to, like I said, forming families and helping them to flourish. Now, the, uh, as we talk about this, the, the negotiations are ongoing, and so one of the, uh, the key Democratic members of the Senate that has been uh, kind of an obstacle to the left is uh, Senator Manchin of West Virginia, and he has uh, demanded a much smaller package. So some of these things that we're talking about may be jettisoned in the end, but what I have saw so far is that they're going to keep their foot in the door on all of these issues. They may only uh, have them for a certain period of time as opposed to having them permanently into law. But as we know, once something starts, it never ends at the federal level. So let's talk about the impact upon child care and education. That's a big issue when we've seen uh, parents getting engaged with the indoctrination of their children taking place in public schools. They're pushing back. This appears to take it to the next level of indoctrination. That's exactly right. And what we've seen in these negotiations is that this is the one program all sides want is the child care piece. Because when you ask Americans, do you want help to help you raise your kids? Uh, people are favorable to that. But when you look behind the scenes, you look into this bill to see the program, not only is it bad for the economy in the way that it would restructure the entire child care industry, but just like you said, Tony, it would remove flexibility to allow parents to choose the working situation that works best for them, and which many prefer to take care of their own kids in their own home, raise them with their values, with their biblical own biblical worldview. Rather, it push all 
two parents both working outside the home 40 hours a week and those kids right into institutionalized daycare into pre-k all the way up through the public school like we know it continuing that radicalization at an even younger age and well I mean, there's so much there to unpack when we've seen what's been happening in public education uh, over the last uh, you know year and a half in particular as parents have seen behind the curtain because of the covid uh, outbreak and they've been involved in their children's education. But it, it, the more we look, uh, the more we find. And this would only accelerate that. Let's talk about the radical gender ideology that is also tucked away in this reconciliation bill. Yeah, for starters, it, it equates marriage with domestic partnerships, again, undermining that time-tested institution that's marriage. But beyond that, throughout all of these family programs, you're seeing outreach to the LGBT community, specific language in there, rising up sexual orientation and gender identity at the expense of true families. And where that would impact most, Tony, is again, these child care and education pieces. You look at a state like California, which under this, pro uh, this program would have full flexibility to set their own curriculum for the preschools statewide, whether it's religious or otherwise, if you participate in this, they get to st set the curriculum. And they've already shown that they want to start radicalizing children as young as the age of three into gender ideology. This is not what we need at this time. We need flexible uh, curriculums where, we, where you know, pre-K and education tr teaches truly good values, not radicalizing our nation's youth. Yeah, and it's important to note that uh, those institutions that uh, you may want to put your child into that has a faith-based component, they would be excluded from this because they would not uh, subscribe to the redefinition of human sexuality, the redefinition of marriage, which the government in this administration uh, would demand. Uh, very, very quickly, Connor, as we close, the, the issue of the, the, the impact upon the economy uh, many are saying that this is going to create problems with inflation. We're going to see a huge rise in debt. How is this going to affect the average family? Directly, Tony. All those things we just talked about would be exacerbated even more with the rising cost of inflation. At your home prices, gas, you name it, we're already seeing it. This would only make it worse. Not only would it impact working class families now, but as we've talked, the deficit would just continue to climb, continuing to impact generations to come. So, Connor, final question, true or false, is the, call, the price tag here zero? Absolutely not. It, uh, it, it, it's going to cost in many ways. In fact, uh, as the, uh, the administration has said, this is only going to impact the wealthy and corporations. First off, we know corporations pass this on to the consumers uh, and those that do business with them. But if you look in this, the average family is going to be impacted directly and indirectly in ways that uh, ultimately is going to affect our spending power, our ability to care for our families. Yeah, this is definitely not a zero price tag. They just continue to end around these uh, budget estimates. Um, but you're right, it's going to continue to impact us, not just here now, but for, for years to come. All right, Connor, Connor Simmelsberger, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate all the great work you do on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Tony. And folks, I want to encourage you, we have a new resource, Six Things You Need to Know About Biden's Anti-Family Budget Buster. You can find it at frc.org slash spending. Now, we just covered some of the high points or low points, if you will, of the measure. But you can find out more by going to frc.org slash spending.